and good evening. My name is Josh Clark, and I am the head of schools here at the Spank School, and I am also the executive director of the Dyslexia Resource, and we are so excited to have you here tonight. We cannot uh, uh, extend enough appreciation for you taking the time to be a part of this incredibly important conversation and what we know to be an incredibly important movement and how we think about serving and supporting our dyslexic students. So again, thank you. Um, and now I, you can all appreciate this. There's some things I have to read to make sure I get them right. And asking a dyslexic person to read about dyslexia in front of you is a little intimidating. So I appreciate you all uh, bearing with me. But I, I, uh, I do again want to thank you all, and I, I can't tell you how humbled we were to have the opportunity to be part of Made by Dyslexia's Dyslexia Showcase in partnership with Microsoft. Um, and if you're not familiar with the Skank School and why we're sitting here tonight, the Skank School is the oldest elementary school in the country serving students with dyslexia. Next year, we'll be entering our 60th year of serving incredibly bright young people who have an unexpected difficulty learning to read, write, and spell. And I came on three years ago, and I'm honored to be a part of it. Many, three to five years ago, the Board of Trustees was inspired by the amazing work that happened here at the Skank School, and we knew we had to do more. So five years ago, the school started a separate uh, non-for-profit called the Dyslexia Resource, which is the outreach arm of the Skank School that has a mission to empower communities to serve dyslexic learners. So about a year ago, when we got a call from Made by Dyslexia to be part of their dyslexia awareness training videos, I could not have thought of a better way to extend that mission and to do that work and, and uh, was uh, just amazed by the opportunity for not only to, to spread what we know, but to have a global impact in doing it. So uh, again, we are uh, humbled and honored to, to be a part of it. So in just a moment, uh, we are officially going to begin our program, and I'm very excited to bring to the stage in just a few moments Miss Robin Corno. Did I do it right? Corno. I, Kerno, I'm sorry, Robin, I practiced about 15 times, and then I read it. Uh, <laughs> Robin Kerno. <laughs> Thank you, Robin. Um, and so Robin is a CNN anchor on CNN International. She previously worked as a CNN correspondent reporting from Africa, Europe, and Asia. She holds a master's degree in international relations from Cambridge University. Uh, we are so humbled and privileged that she is lending her talents and her expertise tonight by serving as our MC. So with that, I will welcome Robin to the stage. Thank you. Thank you so much for being here. Hi, everyone. It's great to be here. Thanks so much. And also, everybody on Facebook, welcome. Hope you enjoy the conversations as well. So yes, my name is Robin. I am dyslexic as well. And I only really realized, only figured it out a few years ago when my youngest child was diagnosed as dyslexic. Uh, that is why there are a lot of familiar faces in this audience who I'm very grateful to. So it was, quite, it was quite a startling realization for me. I, I, edit, I was in my 40s, and I looked back, and suddenly everything fell into place. Slowly, the light bulb went on, off, either way you want to turn to talk about it. And I didn't, it, it was the realization that dyslexia, in, in learning about it with my child, in her going through her journey to literacy, I kind of went on my own and relived my own journey to literacy. And it was that realization that dyslexia wasn't just writing backwards, that it was a spectrum of weaknesses, challenges, and strengths. And I firmly believe now, looking back, I wish I'd known that I was dyslexic five years ago, 10 years ago, 20 years ago. But looking back, I wouldn't change having dyslexia for not having dyslexia. I think it has made me who I am. And it will certainly defines my career, and it defines the mother I am, even. And, and I find that an extremely wonderful thing to be able to say in front of all of you, and certainly in parenting a dyslexic child. So what was interesting, though, is trying to explain it to people who know you. And I mentioned to a colleague, an acquaintance a few months ago, um, that I was dyslexic. And she was horrified. She looked at me, and she went, you don't look dyslexic. <laughs> and I'm like, Oh, I don't know. I mean, did she think I, it was some sort of disability, physical disability, some sort of secret cult with a handshake? That she, I mean, I have no idea what she thought, but I can tell you one thing. She could really do with watching this next video, so have a look. <laughs> Our 
or if you're dyslexic, it's kind of your superpower. It's like the way that you think. Our brains, uh, they're wired to, I think, process information differently. It's just the way that you see the world. I don't think people do think the way I think. And we're curious. Uh, we're creative. The way I see the world might be different from somebody else, but that's valid. In fact, it's vital. The imagination, the storytelling, the communication, the empathy, all these positives. You can simplify things. Uh, we see the big picture. In a world which is pretty competitive, I think to be able to look at it differently is a huge advantage. Dyslexic minds have exactly the skills we need for the workforce of tomorrow. My spelling makes people laugh. It makes me laugh, actually. And my reading, if I'm sight reading, oh, it's, it's a complete joke. School was pretty difficult, to be honest. Um, I wasn't a, a massive fan of the classroom. I used to always hide in the store cupboard. Unfortunately, my English teacher knew that that was my spot. <laughs> It was hard for me to focus and concentrate in class. I hated reading, I hated writing, like spelling in public, re reading out loud. Dyslexia can cause real challenges in traditional education. Memorising lots of facts and figures, uh, it can be difficult. We're not teaching kids to think, we're teaching kids to pass exams. If education is a challenge for a child with dyslexia, you need to understand how to educate them so that it isn't. A challenge. One in five children suffer from dyslexia. That's 20% of the classroom. And yet, teachers aren't trained to recognise this. I think it's vital that teachers are trained about dyslexics. Because the world is changing and, uh, and imagination is key to everything. And there's going to be a lot of kids whose potential are lost unless we train our teachers to effectively teach them. Imagine a world where you've got, you know, a little where you've got like a force of people who have this gift of dyslexia educated in a way that supports them. It means anything's possible, you know. It means anything is possible. So let's, we're here to celebrate, I think, in many ways, Made by Dyslexia, Microsoft and Skank School, who all together are doing some amazing work. So I want you to come onto stage, please, Josh Clark, and also Kate Griggs from uh, Made by Dyslexia and Beth Watson from Microsoft. And I just want to have a conversation about that, that movie, which is fabulous. And Kate, to you, from Made by, you've flown over here from London, and this is a mission for you. Why is it, why is dyslexia so important to you? And what is your message? So I'm incredibly lucky because um, I and um, actually my whole family went to an amazing school. Um, a mainstream school in the UK that supported dyslexia. Um, it was actually set up in the 1930s, um, and so we've known that long how you support dyslexic kids. We've also known for that long that with dyslexia comes this amazing way of thinking. So from a personal level, I just want every parent to have that access to that education, because it's hugely, hugely important. But also, we're, we're living in a, a world of change. Um, we have the fourth industrial revolution well um, uh, here, and the type of thinking and the type of intelligence that the world needs today is exactly how dyslexic people think. So there's a huge value to the world in actually finding these kids and giving them the support. So that's our mission as a global charity, is to help the world understand dyslexia and then produce tools and um, online resources so everybody can access the training and the support that kids need. And that's what's so key. It's sort of democratizing what, what you experience in a positive way, what you give to a limited amount of Atlanta children. And, and Microsoft is helping with that. I mean, how, how exciting is this project and how, how much bigger do you think it's going to get as well? So I think Microsoft is... is Oh, and always has been committed to ensuring every person on the planet achieves more. When we look at education, it's about ensuring every student achieves their full potential. A recent study sort of showed that one in five students has dyslexia. So it's imperative that we support those students and empower them to, to succeed in life. Uh, yeah, so t tell us, talk us through these videos as well. I mean, how, how, how key are they? So we've worked and partnered with Made by Dyslexia to have teacher training. One of the biggest challenges um, for a dyslexic student is even when they have been identified, getting that right support. And one of the biggest challenges for an educator is to know how to support effectively. 
So there's nothing better than working with the amazing schools around the world and people like Kate and Made by Dyslexia to really bring together this teacher training to enable educators to take it into the classroom with more confidence. Yeah, and how frustrating is it for you? You're dyslexic, we know the ways to, to help dyslexic kids and so few kids have that opportunity that, you know, kids ca coming here, even within Atlanta, yeah. never mind in other places or in South Africa where I'm from. So how frustrating is that and how much of a, how much of a relief is it to be able to share? Sure, yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it's, it's incredibly frustrating to think that you have tens of thousands of these incredibly bright kids sitting in a classroom who aren't being recognized and aren't being supported. And I always say that the double-edged sword of dyslexia is that you're smart enough to know it's not working. So it's not that you're sitting there and you're oblivious. You have second and third graders who are trying so hard and are so capable and are just being beaten down because we don't have the tools and the awareness. So when, when, when Kate called and said we have this opportunity to not only take folks that have an expertise in, in dyslexia, but also folks that have achieved amazing things and to talk about and to not only say, I did this, I'm dyslexic. Many of them say, I did this because I'm dyslexic. And I think that is a huge part of this conversation. And, and uh, not only are we going to help teachers, we're going to empower people to understand that I am capable of doing so much. Yeah, I mean, it, it turns out that big picture thinking is, comes more naturally to a dyslexic than being able to spell dyslexia. <laughs> yes, very true. Yes. <laughs> I don't know about you, but it doesn't come out the first time ever. <laughs> um, so, so what is the, I mean, also, was it hard trying to just funnel the one or two or three main points that you needed to get off? quickly and fast to teachers in this? Oh, what, how did you decide uh, what, what needed to be shared the most? It was, it was incredibly difficult, and Kate was such a wonderful partner uh, to, to help us say, simplify, simplify, yeah. simplify. Just tell the story. Um, yeah, yes, yes. Um, but you know, we started this and we wanted to tell everybody everything, right? Yeah, Down to the very, absolutely. you know, uh, A to Z. And we realized that we can, we can educate people. We don't have to turn the world into dyslexia experts. We can give them enough knowledge to know it's not something to be afraid of, it's not something that we can't talk about, and it's not something that we need to hide from our, our, our kids. One of the most powerful parts of being a, a part of this is I've received calls from all over the country of people calling to say to me, you know, thank you so much for being, uh, uh, with the Skink School being part of this with Made by Dyslexia. I watch these videos with my third grader. And that, I just, no, excuse me, I never expected that. that. That was this wonderful opportunity to get right to the students and not just the teachers. Yeah, and from your point of view, I mean, this is just the beginning for Made by Dyslexia, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we've released five um, awareness modules, which are on the Microsoft Educator platform. Uh, we have five more modules coming later in the year, and then we're going to be back over filming in Atlanta um, and filming in the UK as well for the more in-depth training, which will be released next year. So. Um, our mission really is to, to help educators to get skilled up, but it, it's for parents too. It's, you know, there's lots of amazing insight and, and support for parents. Because the, the crazy thing is that our teacher training colleges around the world don't routinely train teachers in dyslexia. And if it's one in five kids in your classroom, which a lot of research is suggesting it is, that is a huge number of students. Well, every teacher is going to be teaching a dyslexic kid. Absolutely. And the other thing is, what works for dyslexic children works for all kids. So it, it's really a win-win. It's just making sure we get the right intervention into schools and, and the right way of, of teaching them reading from the get-go. From Microsoft's point of view, how do you get this out to as many people as possible? So I think it's a couple of things. Mm -hmm. The first is getting people comfortable with saying, I have dyslexia or my child has dyslexia. And I think the work that, that Kate and Made by Dyslexia are doing there is really, really helping. From a Microsoft perspective, we amplify that via blogs, via events. So at the ISTE event this year, you'll see Made by Dyslexia um, on our booth. And you will also see the Made by Dyslexia pledge, which I'm sure Kate will touch on in a minute. From uh, getting it into schools and getting it into people's hands, we released uh, a couple of years ago an amazing set of tools called Learning Tools. Um, this is a free service and one of my colleagues, Mike, will be showing it um, probably near the end of this. But it's really getting that in and, and enabling parents, teachers, students to, to touch and to feel and them talking about it. It's so much more powerful from, from when it comes from someone that's been 
positively affected by it, rather than from us saying, hey, we've got this. Mm. Uh, the other thing that I thought was interesting is that all these wonderful things, we the sort of the voice to text and sort of splitting up sentences or underlining or highlighting or splitting up various sounds, uh, sort of, that, that, that helps, doesn't it? Yeah. I mean, even, even just on, as you're trying to write something. Absolutely, and we're finding, although originally we said this for students, we're seeing everyone all the way through using it. I mean, you've got to think there's 700 mis million dyslexics around the world. That's a massive number. And we're seeing more and more people embracing learning tools. Because, it, like you said, we've got the ability of text-to-talk, we've got text-to-speech, we've got the ability to break words up, but we also even have Pictionary. So maybe you look at a word, you don't know what that means, you click on that word, there's a picture. It's all about giving kids the confidence they need to succeed. Because honestly, these kids are so brilliant. And if we can help them overcome this, we set them on that journey of life to succeed. Is this framing dyslexia as a superpower, how important is that? And I want to ask both of you that question as a gift, as something positive. So I personally never use the word gift. I know a lot of people do. Um, we, we've done really extensive research um, into dyslexia and the strengths. Um, as a charity, we're called Made by Dyslexia because everybody um, who we work with is dyslexic. Um, the school I went to was based on the fact that you have these brilliant kids that can't read, then became called dyslexia. Um, the alumni seriously reads like a who's who of presidents, prime ministers, just extraordinary people from all over the world. Um, dyslexia, without a shadow of doubt, is a really brilliant way of thinking. Um, and, and I strongly believe that we have to be demonstrating that side of things because nine out of ten dyslexic people say it's their strengths that have helped them to succeed. And we need to start listening to dyslexic people that, you know, we're millions of us around the world give us the right start in life. Teach us to read because we can all read if you give us the right support. And, and the world really is our oyster. And I mean, I, I, I can testify to that. I mean, as a journalist, I mean, I think it's a natural place, habitat for, for, for dyslexics. I mean, particularly television news. If you think about it, we, we, think, we expect it to think in pictures, tele, tele, television news story, uh, you write your own script, of very short sentences, no need for spelling or grammar, you read out your own, your, your own piece, nobody's reading it, you, they're hearing your story. And then the best thing from my point of view in terms of my career is that as a journalist, you expect it to either walk into a situation and assess what is the most important piece of information you need to give out, or what I'm doing now is anchoring, you get this vast amount of information either coming in your ear or from the wires or in a breaking news situation coming from all around you and you've got to figure out and be that filter by which to sort of again uh, sieve through all that information and come out with the main bits that are really relevant to an audience watching you know, around the world to billions of people. And I only realized that actually that's a dyslexic strength after I'd had a career playing to those strengths. And I think that's the key, isn't it? Is playing to the strengths, with whatever you want to call it. Yeah, uh, definitely, definitely. And you know, and without a doubt, dyslexia causes some incredible challenges for our kids. And if they, and if they they don't get identified and they don't get support, without a doubt, it is it is a struggle uh, that at times can be hard to see as as an advantage. But when given the right situation. It, it is that very piece that makes it difficult that can also create those things. And so on, on a personal level, when, when my son was diagnosed with dyslexia in uh, second grade, I sat him down and I said, guess what, buddy? You inherited my gift. And there's days you're going to look for the receipt and you're going to want to return it. And I get that. But the best part about this is you're going to have to figure out how to do things differently. You're going to have, when everyone else goes left, you're going to have to turn right. But that is going to be such an amazing opportunity for you as you go through life. L like you were just saying. Uh, yeah. uh, even as I sit here now, I am so much more comfortable talking in front of people versus reading from a script. Because I had to figure out early on how to make it look like I knew what I was doing uh, outside of a traditional classroom uh, expectation. That's why I can ad lib and for hours on, on live television, but yeah. sometimes I struggle reading the prompter and I mix up the words 
eclectic with electric, or <laughs> there's no ways I'm going to be able to read meteorologist and philanthropist. <laughs> <laughs> Zero chance. Yep. So, yeah, and you just, you either skip them or you don't have them in there. Yep. Um, so, yes, and that's also another thing is that I think, you know, from, from, from everyone's point of view, whether you're trying to teach dyslexics, you're trying to help dyslexics, or you are one, there is a, a sense that the pathways are different, the wiring, and that again brings challenges and weaknesses. It does, and I think it's the, the most important thing is, is to remember there are challenges and weaknesses and to focus on the strengths because it is what will help you in life, it is what will build your confidence. I think the, the issue is that we don't have that expertise in every school. Uh, if you look at the, the downside of what happens when you don't identify these kids and you don't give them the support they need, it's a big issue for the world. And, and if you couple that with the fact that we now know from the, re uh, the um, report that we're going to talk about later with EY, we know we need these, these people, we need these thinkers. So it really is a time for the world to, to act, to look at what we've known since the 30s or the, the um, 60s, mm -hmm. 60s um, and just make sure that all kids are getting the start because it, we have to democratise the support. And it's not just about children, is it? I mean, I'm sure a lot of the people that are using Microsoft are undiagnosed dyslexics or self-diagnosed dyslexics at the age of 42. <laughs> yeah, I think that's, that's absolutely true. I think a lot of parents go to, and, and certainly myself included, you support your child as best as you can. Um, and then the homework starts reminding you of the challenges you had at school. So bit by bit, um, they're looking for help. And um, we've got a wealth of, of videos on our website of students and parents that have been helped by learning tools. And I think it's not the only option out there, but I would really say that it's, it's proven to help. The other thing I would say about dyslexia is there's not a, a one approach fits all. Every child is different. So it's really about picking those elements that are going to help each individual to that child. And, and I really think the work you do here and the work you do is just so amazing. Are you able to monitor or quantify how many times it's watched and where, it's, where these are watched? And, and are you able to then in some way channel it to some areas? Give me some sense of the sort of the data so, behind it. So we launched the teacher training um, back in... End of January. End of January. And since the end of January, we've had 75,000 teachers do this training. Um, and, and it's just an hour, isn't it? It, it is. And mm -hmm. Mike will be talking through mm -hmm. just how many educators have consumed it. In terms of our videos around dyslexia and how, how we support it, um, if you just go and, and look on our websites, I don't know the numbers offhand, but I know that it, it's huge. What we're doing is taking those educators that have really signed up to do um, the Microsoft Educator Community course and looking at where they are and then seeing how can we add that additional support because the, the training we've done first off is phenomenal. The next tranche that's coming out, which is just going to be amazing, really making sure those educators are aware of that as well and also ensuring that educators that maybe aren't aware of this training are made aware and drive and, and try it. And again, you know, we're doing this, we're not perfect, so any feedback or ideas or ways that Microsoft can better support, please, you know, let us know. Learning Tools came about, um, and I'm trying not to steal Mike's thunder, <laughs> but, <laughs> but um, I'm going to. No, I'm not. Um, Learning Tools came about as a project um, in a hackathon. So a team of engineers came, brought, brought to life Learning Tools. So I'm not going to say any more than that. But suffice to say, if you come to us and say, hey, we have this problem, we'll lean in and work with you to see how we can resolve that. And just finally, because we want to start wrapping up, when I spoke to you about trying to get the most important things across on these videos in particular, what is it you want the message to be? I mean, is it about specifics of teaching? Is it about attitude? Is it about confidence? What is the one tool you think you've given teachers? Sure, and, and, and Kate touched on this earlier. I think the most important thing, if we take nothing else away, it's the idea that when our schools are designed to support dyslexic learners, every single person in the building benefits. This isn't about creating something over in a corner or taking something away. It's that we are talking about the science of reading and delivering that science and those techniques to all of our schools, which will change the life of a dyslexic student and benefit everybody in the classroom. 
Yeah, I, I completely agree. And it, it's actually, you know, it really is time to stop procrastinating <laughs> and to start doing. And that's very much what we're trying to do with everything we do as a charity. Because the tools are literally here. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, it's been fascinating talking to you. I wish I could carry on. Um, but we've got some other really amazing guests as well. So um, I'm going to ask you to kindly leave the stage. Thank you. And Thank you. Um, you, I know in your goodie bags, you've got a lot of information on Made by Dyslexia um, and the Skang School. Both also have amazing websites where you get a lot of information um, that I think a lot of people would find useful. Also in your goodie bags, you have this, which is the value of dyslexia. It's the EY report, again, commissioned to basically ex explore what dyslexic thinking brings to the workplace. So we have a little video on that. Take a look. Made by Dyslexia's aim is to highlight the positive side of dyslexia, the strengths that are associated with dyslexia. We're aware that there are issues in education and how education is focusing on the deficit and the difficulties. But that's also the case in the workforce where people are more focused on the things that dyslexics can't do than they are focused on the things that they can. So we wanted to change that with, with some research and with some evidence that actually really looked at the positives and the strengths. It's very easy to get involved in the value of dyslexia report for two reasons. Um, First one is uh, my job at EY is to make sure we build the most high-performance company ever and therefore making sure that we know how to work with our dyslexic individuals and take advantage of their strengths is incredibly important to me and the rest of the organisation. The second is our purpose at EY is building a better working world. Um, how better to get involved with that than to make sure that we contribute to the work that Made by Dyslexia is doing and is needed in the rest of society. EY took the dyslexic thinking skills framework and mapped them across the World Economic Forum skills of the future. They looked at the six skills that dyslexics tend to have, visualizing, imagining, communicating, exploring, connecting, and reasoning. We found that dyslexic strengths align to core work-related skills and abilities of the future. There is a demand for a different type of skill set. The speed of change in the world and the, the skills that people are looking for in the, in the, in the new world or the, the, during the fourth industrial revolution are different to, to the skills that have been looked for in the past. And dyslexics match very well with their future state. A common trait amongst dyslexic individuals is that they usually have big picture thinking, the ability to see things a bit differently and to think differently, approach problems and solutions differently, it can really actually bring a better solution to a complex problem. Globalisation is upon us, the te technological solutions and advancements are completely changing how we interact with each other, which essentially means that at work now we're working across boundaries, across borders, not just across offices. So we need to have types of people who are comfortable with that level of change and dyslexic individuals specifically are very comfortable with moving and shifting. The people aspect of our business is very important in a changing environment and dyslexics are essential, I think, to that change and that innovation and the creativity. The ability and the confidence to be able to, be able to go talk to someone is really important and dyslexics naturally have this ability to manage upwards and to communicate effectively with people. So if you're an organisation that needs big problem-solving skills, needs creativity, needs individuals that can do detail but then step back and see a vision, well then I think dyslexic individuals have something to offer to your organisation. 70% of people who are dyslexic hide their dyslexia from their employers, which is crazy because we know that dyslexia has this incredible pattern of strengths and if they can open up and tell their employers that they're dyslexic, then we can focus on those strengths and also give the support to the challenges as well. I know in our organisation we try and lean in and step forward and make sure that people feel comfortable about talking about who they are. We have a phrase which is, runs really deep in our culture, which is bring all of you to work. We want people to have a high belonging here because under that atmosphere, I think they contribute the best. It really is about having that conversation about understanding what this actually is for that individual. And firstly, how can we help them, enable them at work? And secondly, where can we target these strengths? If today we were to employ superwoman, what we wouldn't do is complain that she can't handle kryptonite. We'd look at how good she is and all the wonderful other things she does, but we'd never, never really draw attention to that kryptonite is not her thing. Surely that's a job that all of us have to do. 
with our dyslexic colleagues. It is the responsibility of employers to create inclusive environments, but it's also, I think, the responsibility of individuals to really find where you fit. And being dyslexic is all about that. It's all about finding that right place for you and not trying to fit in to places that aren't ready for you. At EDY, we made the bold move three years ago to radically change the way we looked at the criteria for which people applied to our organisation. And actually, we were really keen to create a level playing field so we remove things like academic criteria, the schools or universities you went through, the jobs and responsibility on the internships you might have to make sure that we cast our net as wide as possible before you embark upon your assessment with us. Particularly from my experience at school, I, did not, I would not have the grades to be able to, from GCSE and A-levels, to work with, you know, within a big four. So without EY's um, hiring processes, I wouldn't be in this seat today. I think the first thing I would say to other businesses is, is read the report and get engaged with Made by Dyslexia. I think that's a great starting point. Uh, and one of the missions that we're on is to make sure that other organisations understand that if you can be more inclusive about how you look at talent, actually you end up with a stronger organisation. We've had the most incredible response to the value of Dyslexia report. People have been reading it across the globe, taking it into their employers, taking it into their schools and shouting about the value of dyslexia, which is exactly what we wanted to achieve. We're really excited for the next steps and actually making sure this message gets to absolutely everybody, but also the next report that we're working on with EY right now. It really is fascinating. Um, take your time and hand it over to your human resources departments as well. <laughs> Might be a good idea as, as well. So for our next panel, this is successful dyslexics coming to talk about themselves and their success. So please come onto the stage. I want to welcome Mike Altman, who's the Chief, in Chief Investment Officer at Cortland. Also Richard Court, the fourth principal at Atlantic Realty Company, and Dr. James Calaroz White, who's head of Galloway School, which is actually just down the road in one of the great schools in Atlanta. Gentlemen, it's great having you here. Um, well, before we start, I mean, the main point is everybody's talking about the benefits of dyslexia, so let's start with that. Um, in your success, how has dyslexia in many ways made you stand out or get you where you are? I'll start with you, Dr. Uh, <clears throat> well, I would say that you know, the, the biggest thing is that um, uh, the, this coming to terms with the fact that you are dyslexic and what that uh, actually means for you. And for a long time, um, I thought of myself as very clever, um, not understanding that you know that there's actually a real skill set that comes with being. You said dyslexic. earlier you thought you were clever, not smart. Yeah, I was. I was, and so people would say, "Oh, you're really smart," and I was like, "No, I'm actually more clever than I am smart." <laughs> um, but um, and, and then there was a real distinction in my head, and you have to understand that I was diagnosed when I was in high school, and so um, the the skills and the coping mechanisms and things that I learned before. I was actually diagnosed, that was the thing why I didn't think of myself as being smart because uh, smart kids didn't work that hard. They didn't copy things down uh, multiple times. They didn't misplace the numbers. Uh, they could read out loud uh, and, you know, properly. Uh, and so those, that's what smart kids did. Clever kids figured out ways not to do all those things. Still <laughs> um, and so that's why I always consider myself clever. Um, and, um, Can I it, high five? Yeah, exactly. Uh, and, uh, and so uh, from that perspective, w what, what I what I've come to learn now that uh, I'm in, you know, in this work and, and, and so forth is, is that those skills that I learned when I didn't know that I was dyslexic um, were actually really the foundational pieces. And so when you talk about this idea of not changing that trajectory and that path um, in terms of, you know, when you found out and, and, and knowing, uh, I would say the same things. Uh, I am much more aware of my own dyslexicness uh now, uh, my own cleverness, uh, if you will. <laughs> uh, and so I, I still, you know, I use that to my advantage. Um, and I love this idea that uh, dyslexic, that we are big picture thinkers, that we can process information in ways and be um, creative in ways that our, our smart counterparts don't sometimes get. Um, and I think for me, I use that to my advantage because I, it makes me constantly think about for, because I work with kids, about what they need and how they need it uh, and uh, little things about uh, organizations to change them so that folks like me don't get mixed, uh, don't get missed um, in what is tr uh, typically of traditional processes. So. Yeah, that's fascinating. Yeah. Uh, and Mike, to you, how, how have, how's your dyslexia helped you? Well, I, I thought of that question or the answer mm -hmm. really with, with two things. First of all, um, 
in a in a business setting you know we're constantly trying to communicate and i think that there's a a ten uh... trend towards you know communicating in large reports or, or having a lot of you know written format which i just candidly struggle with so i've always been um, proficient in in just finding other ways to communicate more graphs uh... more visuals you know i'm in i'm in real estate so really tending towards maps towards pictures towards uh, renderings um, and really trying to create more visual ways that I can express myself more accurately and then I find that that's actually very powerful for even non dyslexics to yeah. see a graph and like think about concepts in their their relative terms as opposed to you know a, a, a more written uh, sort of uh, verbiage yeah. the other thing I was going to say is that in an organization today we're about 1800 people Everyone, the number one thing that all of my employees are looking for is more communication, right? It's a constant need that there's more communication. And then I can get hundreds of emails in a day, as we all can. And candidly, eh, if I see something that's really longly worded or attachments that are... I, I'm, I'm only laughing because I'm like, oh, man, can I, can I bring him to tell, tell him to talk to my board as well? Oh, no. You know, if someone sends me like some 34-page, you know, a PDF report, you know, <laughs> candidly, that's a really easy, you know, deletion. <laughs> <laughs> so what I like to do instead is invite that person to come and talk to me about it. In which case, I can have four or five other people in the room with me. In which case, five or six of us, eight of us, are now having a conversation about this idea, this research project, this market study, this report yeah. that this uh, teammate has produced. And now we've connected other people together through this Absolutely. communication, this, this sort of conversation. And now it's not just my responsibility to go to communicate the results of that committee meeting or you know, that investment approach to the rest of the organization. Instead, it's all six of our responsibilities. So I found it as a, you know, a, a way of getting sort of a, away from just being behind the computer screen mm -hmm. and instead like back connecting with teammates by not just relying on you know, text and words, but instead relying on visualization and then just interpersonal communication. Yeah, and you did it also to protect yourself. Yeah, that, well, that, I mean, that's for the key. most things I do <laughs> for myself. And, and that's the point, <laughs> exactly. As a, as a struggling <laughs> dyslexic, <laughs> uh, just, you know. And, and, that, and that, that plays into it because, you know, I think a lot of dyslexics turn out to be street fighters in many ways because you have to kind of bob and weave and hustle and trying to figure out a different way of doing something. And it works not only to your advantage, but to everybody else's. Hi, tell us about your, the strengths and the, the kind of defining moments that, that you've... Yeah, that so when I, when I think back about my early childhood education and even high school education, it was a, it was a disaster. Uh, at best, and it was a painful experience. Um, but then looking back at it, it really uh, forced me to learn how to be comfortable working hard. Yeah. And I always had to work harder than everybody else. And so when you get out of school and you're in life, working hard is a great asset. Yeah, um, and so it really, I kind of say, you know, they, there's a great book called David and Goliath that talks about dyslexia and would you wish dyslexia upon your children? And it's actually kind of a tough question to answer, but I think it's... Well, particularly because it's hereditary. Right. You know. Well, and both of my children have it, <laughs> there so we go. They're, they're lucky. But um, it really is a, a great skill to be able to learn how to work hard and efficiently and understand where you're not going to be successful spelling. Both of my children spell better than I do in their yeah fourth and fifth grade, um, and, and being able to uh, use the tools like Microsoft and uh, spell checkers and calculators and spreadsheets. I mean, I, I still make the same mistakes I made in I sixth grade, but I have all these great tools and resources that catch it. Um, I agree with you. I still can't spell achievement, um, and in the last few months, with all the shenanigans in, in, in Washington, I have never been able to spell subpoena. <laughs> just, 
Yes. <laughs> I still can't do it. Um, and then there's dyslexia, and then decipher. I mean, yeah. phonetic. All of those words, they're just not going to come out right the first yeah. time. But thank God for spell check. Yeah, um, with that in mind, I was reading somewhere that, yes, there is the grit and the resilience created by struggle, um, but also the sort of sense that dyslexics, whether you're the five-year-old in the classroom or whether you're in a corporate environment, are used to failing. And that failing becomes, in a way, easier. And with that comes success. Do you agree? I would say um, you definitely, or at least I personally, did experience a, a great degree of failure mm -hmm. in my uh, my education experience, but at the same time, it becomes, uh, you get used to it and it's okay. And I think one of the things that I learned uh, is it's always okay to ask questions. Um, so I ask sometimes ridiculous questions, but there are other people sitting in the room that are thinking the same thing. And, and, and so uh, in a way, it's, uh, it, you help, help other people learn by not being afraid to, to actually uh, Ask a simple for yourself question, and, yeah. how, when, why, what? You'd be a good journalist. <laughs> <laughs> we'll talk about that later. Okay. <laughs> um, so the strengths, but the challenges are there, and I think that's the thing. You don't want to gloss over the fact that, hey, this is great, you want to give it to your kids, this is a gift, but at the same time, you know, it, it, is, it is a difficulty. And what is the one thing you all still struggle with that is still tough and you wouldn't wish it on your child? You know, I think that there's amazing power in books, you know, and, and, and like business books or, you know, I know friends that, you know, read all the time and they're like, oh, I read this great book about this thing. And I'm like, oh, that's so interesting, you know. <laughs> uh, <laughs> you know, I, I would say that I do struggle with that. Like I have a book in my bag, you know, that would, I'd love to read, and I haven't cracked, and I continue to carry it around at the airport. So, uh, <laughs> but you know, I, I think that that's, that that would be the one thing, and you know, it's um, it's a bit intimidating, you know. And sometimes I try, and, and there's a few books that I've gotten into that have just like I've been able to rip through really proficiently, and others I'll just I'll get to page 25 or 30, and you know, I'll just go to sleep. You know, it's just impossible. So, for me to, so I've to, got to the read. solution. There's so. this thing called audiobooks. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. Yeah. I, I've probably listened to 12 audiobooks in the last 12 months. Yeah. Um, no, that's a great example of yeah. a good skill set. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and I don't know. I mean, it's 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 really interesting because um, I think about uh, I, and I do have young kids right now, and and I'm pretty sure one of them is. Close, um, uh, but uh, but you know I, I watch them in terms of the just their because I'm in education. The watching kids learn has always been a part of the work that I do, and so watching them learn now and watching even uh, my middle daughter right now, the tricks that she uses uh, are are very similar to some of the things that that I do, and so I'm constantly like, okay, is that something that I taught her? Or is that something that she has? Right, mm -hmm. um, but. Um, you know, I think that when it comes to, to children, all of those things that, that can be perceived as challenges, I also have tried to really push and say those are opportunities. Opportunities to figure out more about yourself, mm -hmm. to understand what identity really means, and, and to be proud of that. Um, I wasn't always proud of the fact that I was dyslexic, and I think that that's one of the things that I really stressed upon uh, my own kids and also those kids that I work with, that this is, there's nothing to be ashamed of. Uh, and in fact, you know, it's something that you can be really proud of in terms of, you know, what that means for you long term, the skills that you develop because of it. Um, and so, you know, I think it's hard to say whether I would wish it on someone because um, I don't know that, uh, I don't know what it's like to not have it, yeah. you know. Um, and so I don't know for those smart kids out there if they have it better than when I had it, right? <laughs> um, but, um, and so, but what I can say is that whatever that gift is, whatever that thing is, and in this particular case we're talking about dyslexia, the, the biggest thing for me is making sure that there's no stigma attached to it, that it is okay, that it is normal, or whatever normal is supposed to mean, um, but that it is something that you don't have to be ashamed of. Um, there was this piece up there where they were talking about hiding it from your employers and that kind of thing, and I think 
early on in my career, it was definitely not something that I would come right out and talk about uh, in a job interview. Yeah. Um, but as I've gotten much more comfortable, it's something that I think my employer has to know about me uh, if they're going to hire me. Yeah, that was going to be my next question. I mean, would you hire a dyslexic? And would you suggest that dyslexics put it right up there on the front page of their CV, along with, you know, alternative wiring of brain, sees big picture, <laughs> creative, you know. I mean, I, I, how, how much should be out there, particularly in a, in a mar you know, mar markets like Atlanta or even the U.S.? I think that sharing vulnerabilities is yeah. a really powerful way to connect with other people. And sharing vulnerabilities is, is, you know, difficult, but at the same breath, it, it makes the other person comfortable for them to do the same. And, and I can just tell you a story from today. Okay. I was um, meeting with somebody who's coming out of the military out of an amazing career. Uh, he's currently, you know, the top advisor in the White House, trying to figure out his new, his next steps. And, and we're having this conversation. He's not sure if he wants to you know, he's talking all different uh, industries and he's a really decorated individual. And I, sh you know, I told him, I said, you know, I'm dyslexic and this is how, you know, I dealt with this. And then he shared in, uh, about something. And like the point was like talking about the fact that I'm going to lead you in this way. I'm going to receive your information in this way. This is who I am. Yeah. Opens up the conversation for me to understand how they are. So in an interview with a, you know, a top candidate, I would often just share openly that I am dyslexic. Okay. And, and I think that it's really about showing people that um, this is who I am, and then they'll more willingly show who they are. And I think, it, back to your, your point about your children, um, I see it uh, now that I'm a parent and, and watching my children grow, but there is still struggle. Yeah. And you can't remove the struggle, and that's, okay, but it also, um, with struggle comes uh, things like empathy mm -hmm. for others. And, and those are skill sets, life skill sets, that you carry throughout your life. And you know, you get out of high school and it's, it's gonna be okay. Yeah. Um, uh, you just uh, gotta get out of high yeah. school. Yeah, what? <laughs> yeah, that, that is true. Um, but I'll add one thing that I mm -hmm. think is important, and I think it's um, panels like this and things like this that get the word out that this is okay have to continue to happen. Um, because I can tell you that um, leading with this, depending on who you're talking to, is not necessarily always a good thing. Um, because, th th because there's still, unfortunately, a stigma out there that you can't, that you're not good at. You might look that funny. You, you, you might look, yeah, exactly. <laughs> I forgot funny. about you. Yeah. <laughs> you might, you know, do I look this much? Um, and I think that, that that's, the, that's the piece that we, we do have to be mindful of because while we can sit up here and talk about all the strengths and the wonderful things that being dyslexic does and has done for us, um, there's a whole world out there that is still very miseducated uh, or undereducated, I should say, about what this actually means. And so a night like tonight, an event like this, you know, the partnership of Microsoft and, and, and made by dyslexia, like all of those things, getting this word out, allows for this next generation of dyslexics to come out and be very open and very honest with that uh, to a point where uh, it, they don't have to hide that. And so I, I think, you know, I, I don't want us to get Pollyanna-ish no. in terms of the fact that, yeah, it is this awesome, amazing thing that it is, but not everybody sees it as that. And, and we do have to recognize that our job to get that information out and to continue to push that uh, as a message uh, of hope and of, of you know this this ability for uh, for folks to feel good about it is really an important step as well. And I think that's within our own families. Yeah. I know when I try to tell my mother that you know I was probably also dyslexic, and even in the early days when my child was being diagnosed, I mean just recently she said, "Well, have you fixed it yet?" <laughs> and I mean I've tried. You know I've sent I've sent her the videos, and you know it's like no, but you know we've this is this is so I think there is that that conversation and. Um, it's a conversation that takes place on multiple levels. Yeah. So hopefully, and it is, it's about spreading a message. So thank you all for, for being here. Thank, thank you. you. And well done. <laughs> <laughs> you did okay. <laughs> so, so one of the world's most famous dyslexics uh, is Richard Branson. You guys know him, I'm assuming, yes? And I mean, he literally, when you talk about a visionary aiming for the stars, this guy literally is, isn't he? So he's got a short little message for you. Have a listen. 
Dyslexics have a different but brilliant way of thinking that's so valuable in the world today. So teachers, educators and parents everywhere, please take just one hour to watch the inspiring video course that Made by Dyslexia has developed in partnership with Microsoft. It really will enable you to understand and empower the one in five dyslexic students in your class. Thank you so much. There we go. Okay, so this is where we look past the Pollyanna stuff and get to the nuts and bolts and bring the teachers up. Um, so joining me now is Lavasia Bullard, who is from uh, Thomasville Heights Elementary School, purpose-built schools. Um, Hartstruck, who is a fifth grade teacher here at Skank. Um, Isaline Abels, who's a second grade teacher at Skank as well, and also Amelia Merrill, who is an Orton Gillingham trained teacher at Morningside Elementary School. So you've got a variety of schools here that are covered, uh, and a, an extremely amount of fantastic women who give so much. Uh, I think we should give you a clap anyway <laughs> for, for everything you do for every child that you've already touched. Um, thank you. Um, so welcome, ladies. Um, from, from my point of view, I think the main question I want to ask you is, is, is what, what is the one thing when you're in the classroom that you think when you encounter a dyslexic kid? Whether you've deliberately got 10 of them in front of you or you suddenly think, ah. So I'm going to start with you. Um, they just, I don't know. And I don't know if they're dyslexic or not. It, in public school, it's different. Yes. So but you, you, for us, it's kids that are struggling to read. Mm -hmm. period. And no matter what we do, it helps all of them, whether they're dyslexic or not. So these interventions really help all kids that are struggling with reading. Um, but they tend to think of things in just different ways, like memorizing multiplication facts is never going to happen for them, a lot of them. I mean, not all of them. It's different for each kid. There's but, a reason um, I still can't remember my husband's <laughs> phone number. <laughs> But if you can Literally. teach them other ways yeah. to think of information, like, um, I don't know, I was giving a fifth grade science test the other day to a group of kids that have, you know, 504s or ESOL, for whatever reason, they were with me. And one of them was like, I don't even understand this question. And I said, can you draw it? And he could, like, he understood the content, but he couldn't linguistically get past the language. And once he drew it, he was like, oh, and then he could find the answer. So that kind of just a different way of thinking about information, teaching kids to think differently. And you being a teacher who recognizes that, which is what's so key. In your experience, what, what is the one thing that strikes you about looking at kids thinking, this is, I can give them something? I think the most challenging part has been the lack of understanding or awareness. Mm -hmm. um, as I have learned more, I have also realized I probably was dyslexic growing up and currently now um, to the point where I'm You're trying not fixed. <laughs> no, no. And some of my colleagues have said, why, how do you know how to just explain it this way? And for the longest I've been like, I don't know. But now that I've learned more, I'm like, oh, because I probably needed someone to do that for me. <laughs> um, but I think the, 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 the biggest thing is not thinking about how we typically look at schools. Of, did this kid pass the test? Did they, I taught it this one way, they got it this next time, and they just have it. But really thinking of it as ter in terms of what do I need to do to get this one kid, to get these three kids, to get this one group to get it. And that's really my job as the educator. And I think the more conversations we have, that's what all teachers have to do. Mm -hmm. um, and we've just been able to I, I was going to ask a follow-up question. How difficult, how much more difficult is it for you in the schools the school that you teach compared to an environment like this. Um, is there just a whole nother level of challenges? <laughs> and, 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 and how unhelpful is it listening to people say, oh, you know, we, we've got a gift, we've got a superpower, when really, you know, the I mean, kids who would happily give you back the receipt. Yeah, <laughs> that's been one of the, the most challenging things. Um, a lot of my knowledge has come from private tutoring. The parents invite me with um, in with the psychologist, I see these reports and now I'm like, oh wow, this is a book I can read and I can learn more about this. But in public education, it's you can't say certain things and um, we're not saying that the kid is going down this route. And so there's a lot of tape um, and, and, and sometimes it really impacts us helping the child. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's what I think has been the one, just being able to say there are kids who need something different. Um, and 
then it's just about going to go do it. Um, and, and it's hard because at the end of the day, like I said, and I will say, you don't want to send your child to a school where kids are not passing tests. Mm -hmm. And that's the reality that we live in, but kids are so much more than the test. And we say that, and we all check the schools, and we all check what the scores are, so we don't really have it in practice. Yeah. Um, but when we can accept it and say, the kids are more than the test, and so we're gonna treat them and teach them like that, then I think we'll be at a different place, but in all honesty, we're not there, no. and that pressure is a lot. Um, but we just, we just come every day, and keep trying, get keep the on, Keep on, keep on trying, I mean, that's, that's that's a dyslexic way of living life. You just keep on trying, <laughs> don't you? <laughs> over and over again. It works for me. <laughs> um, it, it, Georgia has just nearly about to pass a bill that makes it mandatory for dyslexic, for, for all kids to be screened for dyslexia. How key is that? And is that enough in terms of you're not diagnosed, but you're screened? Or, and then how do you fix it if you are diagnosed? Well, we know that identifying dyslexia at an early age makes such a great impact because we know that the emotional impact for those students who weren't identified, like we've heard earlier, um, it really takes a toll on these students who are in classrooms where they're unable to be successful. So making sure that we're able to identify these students as early as possible gives them the opportunity to be successful in a classroom. Okay, and it's all about the kids, isn't it? So tell us a story. You've got, I think, what, what I'm sure there is one little boy or one little girl that just never leaves you. Too many, actually. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I love a good story or a good metaphor, but I was thinking of your question, just what does dyslexia look like in a classroom? Or you know, what can that teacher really be looking for? And um, I have a student this year who's new and came through the public school system. And um, fortunately, we got him. And the other day, I was trying to tell the kids, you know, we were going to do something this way, but I had an epiphany, and I changed my mind, we're going to do it this way. And then I thought, oh, these guys don't know what an epiphany is, so I, you know, who knows what an epiphany is? And this kid raises his hand, a sudden realization. A lot better than I was going to explain it, so thank you very much. But this same student came in and cannot spell the word good, and he's in fifth grade. And so on paper, to see that kid, you'd, you, oh, he's not smart, he's not capable. But then you talk to him and he knows what an epiphany is. I mean, it's just night and day. I love, um, in the video, Iselina just keeps replaying in my mind. She says, it's a direct mismatch of what you're seeing when you're talking to them and then what they're be able to produce. I think that's the best little nugget of information. Um, the spelling mistakes might be funny, though. I mean, I oh, know, they're great. I know <laughs> in our house we realized something was wrong when our child, who loves dogs, kept on writing "I heart bogs," oh. <laughs> and we have little things of "I love bogs everywhere." Um, and um, my father, because I realize now he was a, he, he he died many years ago, but I realize now again the penny drops. Oh. He was dyslexic, mm -hmm. and he used to tell the story about how he, he was mocked at school for saying hopper grass instead of reading hopper grass instead of grasshopper. Mm -hmm. But in his last gift to my child, before he died, he misspelt granddad. Mm -hmm. And you think, hmm, I wish someone could have, I wish someone could have helped him. So it's those, you know, my dad died at 64, and I, you know, he was almost illiterate, I think, by the end. And you don't want that for these kids, and so many of them are still having to perhaps be almost illiterate by the time they leave. And it's not because they've missed out on the teaching. The teaching is there, it should be there. Mm -hmm. It is there, um, and there's a lot that we can learn. Um, I, I've, I did everything I could to learn more about teaching literacy. I went and got a reading endorsement, I'm in graduate classes mm -hmm. for literacy, and no one's talking about dyslexia. Really? No. Yeah. Um, they talk about explicit phonics instruction, um, but not naming it and not really giving teachers the tools. Why? And so, I don't know. I believe it's, it's not, some of I this. think it's starting to change. Yeah. Like uh, UGA, I think, is offering some mm -hmm. um, Orton geared coursework this mm -hmm. year. So it's starting to change, basically because of educated parents in places like Skank School that are pushing this. Um, 
but I taught, I don't know, 12 years probably, fourth grade, always fourth grade and up, and realized at some point I had a kid that came to us who was homeless and he couldn't spell cat. I mean, that's where he was in fourth grade and he had been passed through. And I realized I had no, I had been teaching for that long. I had an educational specialist degree. I had no clue how to, I didn't know how to teach anybody to read. I just didn't know how to do it. And so I started doing Orton Gillingham work and it's been like how, how did he do? What? How did he do? Um, he was gone again, a real transient, mm -hmm. so I don't know. <laughs> Is there any student, other student that stood out for you as well? Um, think about it. There's a lot. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned parents. Can can parents be helpful and not so helpful? Yes. Yeah. I think we can learn from parents even when we feel like they're not being helpful, even when we feel like they're being aggressive and pushing the envelope and are anxious. But if we view it as they're trying to help their child, mm -hmm. and we can learn from them. I mean, mm -hmm. really. Yeah, and I think especially that label of dyslexia can be so scary and intimidating, not only as a parent, but as an educator too. Mm -hmm. um, I think teachers are so afraid to mislabel or, you know, they have a reading problem, it rhymes with mislexia, you know, <laughs> that kind of thing, like, or, you know, subtle hints, but. Uh, um, that would be easier to spell. Right, exactly. <laughs> so <laughs> I just think that, like that that label is scary and we're afraid to, you know, a lot of teachers are afraid to suggest it. But I was thinking the other day, um, again, I love a good metaphor. Like if you were in a classroom and you saw a kid squinting at the board, you wouldn't mind calling the parent saying, hey, I think your kid needs glasses. Mm -hmm. It's the same thing. You're not, you know, if you're not comfortable with diagnosing or really you don't have to be that expert, you still can push them in that path, or I think it looks like dyslexia. And then it's amazing to see, you know, parents are, uh, you know, they love their kids, um, and they will go to bat for their children. And I tell that to our 10 kids, I'm like, you go home and hug your parent because mm -hmm. they fought for you to be here. Yeah. And they really had to work because a lot of kids don't get this, and we understand that, and we know we're spoiled, so. But I think in a lot of public schools, kids aren't going to get diagnosed. But even without being diagnosed, even just being able to screen, like, so we screen twice a year, K through five, and that's way more than the dyslexia bill is asking for, obviously. But if you do that, you just catch kids that are struggling, period. Mm -hmm. And if you can intervene, then they may not, they may be able to overcome a lot of it without, mm -hmm. and it's unfortunate that they won't know they're dyslexic. I think that when I had a similar journey where my son was diagnosed and then I was like, oh, <laughs> that's right, I probably am too. And I overcame it by learning oh, tricks. It yes. crushed my confidence mm -hmm. though until I was way older. Mm -hmm. So knowing that, but even knowing like that there's tricks or that there's other ways to learn through intervention, I think can be powerful in helping those kids even without, even if we can't get to the point of getting all those kids diagnosed. I, I wanna ask you two questions. One about, to follow up on the, on the teachers and then also on, on this sort of law that's coming. Screening kids, is that helpful for you? What, 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 if someone's screened, what do you do about it? I think it's very important, um, but I do want to go back to the parent okay, piece um, really quickly. Um, we had a parent, uh, we have a kindergarten student, and the parent is saying, no, my child is so bright. They, 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 they know all of these things at home. And the teacher was saying, okay, Miss Bullard, I, I know what the parent is saying, but I'm telling you what's happening in school. And when I think about kindergarten, it's mostly the foundational pieces. Um, but I had to look at the student's data on her assessment, and she scored above like 50th percentile in terms of comprehension and inferencing, but her phonics and really the foundational pieces, she was in the first percentile. And so when you think about that, the teacher is only seeing this one side, but the parent is saying, I see I've got the a bright. Right. Yeah. Um, and so that's a place where the parent is seeing one thing and the teacher is seeing another, and we really do have to come together and not just say, I'm the teacher and I know how to educate and I know what I see. Mm -hmm. But isn't that the pattern? You see a huge, a huge difference, right? And, and that isn't that one of the clues that you're that seeing is that. And what I was able to say. Wow, wait a minute. Yeah. This child is showing signs of dyslexia. dyslexia. It's like so. Let's figure that out. Let's dig a little bit deeper. Um, but again, had we had a screener and had it been something that we were doing across the board, it wouldn't be. March. So if it's if if the screening becomes mandatory, which we assume it will be. How is that going to impact? 
I think that it is going to be overwhelming, honestly, um, because when you know better, you're charged to do better. And we have to have the right resources and we have to have the right training in order for that to happen. Because just because we know something, a lot of us know a lot of things about ourselves. <laughs> that We don't know how to fix. <laughs> that we are aware of, but it takes some action um, and some, su some support to make that happen. Yeah. It's a great step, but mm -hmm. it's not the only step. Mm -hmm. And there's going to have to be many, many steps after this. Mm -hmm. Just, I, I know, um, Kate said, you know, we've known about this for so long. I mean, it's 2019. Mm -hmm. Why are we still sitting here? You know, mm -hmm. I don't understand, but it's those steps, but at least we're starting. Mm -hmm. Positive yeah. note. Mm -hmm. Very positive. Yeah. Uh, with, with, the par with parents, because in many ways, I mean, I think also one of the reasons I'm here is because I had a mother who was absolutely determined that I wasn't going to not amount to much, as one of my teachers told her once. Um, how crucial is that mother sitting there trying to break up words? If you don't have the mum or the dad or a granny or a teacher, is that also part of the problem, that every kid needs just that one person who's going to go mm -mm, and, pull up and, and pull them up? Absolutely, and I think also, of course, it goes back to knowing what dyslexia is and being educated and identifying dyslexia. Um, because we know the tools and tips and tricks that we can use in the classroom where you don't have to be an expert in this field to start implementing those tomorrow. So I think it's very important, you know, to make sure as an educator that we're able to say, even though I don't have the training, how can I find ways to implement different tr tips and tricks in my classroom so that every child is successful? Um, we're going to wrap up now, but just from your guys' points of view, I, I want you to just tell me very sh in a very brief way or with a word, you you're looking at a dyslexic kid in your, in your class. What do you tell them? How do you, how do you sell it to them in many ways? <laughs> do you sell them the good stuff? Or how, what's the conversation you have? Well, in our classroom, in our school, we celebrate dyslexia, and our kids love that they are labeled um, with the term dyslexia. And I know we spoke earlier about this, but that label should be celebrated. And it's something that is exciting and empowering. And there's a reason that there's so many famous and well-known names that have that exact same label, because they change the world. And we have so many generations that are kind of come before us and do that exact same thing, but they need the tools to be successful in the classroom. Um, just being your own advocate, knowing what you need, and advocating for it, like before this, I was like, um, I'm gonna need questions. <laughs> and then I didn't ask them, sorry. Because I, I forgot what I did. <laughs> but but knowing, knowing what you need yeah. is right. a big part of being a successful dyslexic in the world, because you can start saying, I'm not gonna need more time. <laughs> I'm gonna need this. You need to do yeah. these things for me. And if you can teach kids to do that, they might survive high school better. I don't know. <laughs> and, 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 and for you, I mean, also stuff like saying, oh, I don't think my kid can do French. Let's rather not, right. not do a foreign language or they've got to get an extra half an hour on the test. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think I just tell my kids, especially with the older kids, you're not alone. That okay. simple statement, you're not alone, is just so powerful for them. Your conversation? Um, mine is just about you can do it. Um, and just letting them know, I know it's hard, I'll be here to help you. And I think that's just the confidence, the little boost that they need to know, I know I'm going to struggle with this, just acknowledging instead of making them think it should be easy. But just, I know this is hard, but like, we can do it, we'll figure it out. And they've just got to get through high school and then they can put it on their CV. <laughs> exactly. um, thanks to you all, it's been fascinating. Thank and once you. again, thank you for the work you do every day. <laughs> yeah. Um, so yes, th thanks to you all and everybody on Facebook who's been watching. Hopefully you got something out of this because I think this is the point we, I know we might be preaching to a choir, but um, the, the trick is to actually get something physical and be able to do something about it. And, and there's a lot, lot of tools here. Um, so I'm going to introduce Kate back up here because um, you've got a little bit more to say and a little bit more to share. Thanks everyone. Thank you. I just want to very brief, because I, I know we're going to hand over to Mike to give a fantastic talk about um, learning tools. 
Um, I just really want to say, firstly, thank you everybody for coming. Thank you everybody on Facebook for watching and thank you to uh, the Skank School for being such amazing hosts. Um, we all have a duty to sort this out because it's a huge problem with a very simple solution and we can't do it on our own. The Skank School can't do it on their own. We can only reach so many people. It needs everybody to get behind this. It needs, it needs parents to talk to their politicians. It needs schools to talk to their, their leaders. Um, and we all need to come together and actually say enough is enough. We need to sort this out. And just bear in mind that all of us have a vote. And if we all join together as a vo voice, politicians need our votes. So, you know, we are trying to say to you, this is what needs to happen. This is what we need to do. So really our rallying cry is to all of you to just please take this message forward. Take the training into your schools, whether you're a parent or a teacher, and let's really, really try and sort this out once and for all. So I'm going to hand over to Mike now, and thank you so much, everybody, for coming. Okay. Well, hello, everyone. My name is Mike Tholfson. I'm a product manager on the Microsoft Education team. And so that means I work with the engineering team to build some of the things that you're seeing, but I also work with lots of schools all around the world and in the United States to listen, work with students, work with teachers, and bring those insights back to the team. And I'm going to be talking a lot about inclusive classrooms and some of the things that we're doing specifically inspired by dyslexia, but as Josh mentioned, just helps all students and all people. And just actually, I was lucky enough to get a little tour of the school before I got here today. I, I love this. It was like a little mural on, on the stairwell down from the founder, uh, David Skank. And I also got a, a personalized tour from uh, Ellen, Sm where'd she go? Ellen Hill. And so Ellen gave me a tour. I said the, the library was fantastic. It's a beautiful library, beautiful school. And then a music teacher, Eric, is it music teacher Eric's classroom? Uh, really cool. So thank you for the tour. It's a wonderful school. It's a, the, the facilities and the focus are, are pretty incredible. And I see a lot of schools. And I was quite impressed. Now, in terms of Microsoft's mission, as we mentioned earlier, our mission is to empower every person on the planet to achieve more. And our education mission is to empower every student on the planet to achieve more. And that message itself, empowerment and every, are that's in our mission. It's part of our new CEO's mission, and it's from the top down and also from the bottom up. And so I like to say it's not empower 90.3% of the people on the planet. It's not to empower 97%. It's to empower all of them. And just as a background, to set the stage, this is a large-scale study that was done across the United States, 14,000 teachers by Scholastic. So almost three quarters of classrooms have four or more reading levels, and, and sometimes more than that. Uh, almost three quarters of classrooms have one or more special education students in the general education population. Over half of classrooms have one or more non-native speakers, or English language learners, as they're called sometimes. And on the flip side, you know, all the, the four educators that were up here, amongst all that diversity in the classroom, up to 50% of educator time can be spent on working with these different diverse student needs. And that's, if you have 150 students in a public school across five, six classes, and you're expected to personalize, that is impossible to do. Uh, unless maybe the technology can help, it can't solve the problem, but that can help amplify what the teacher's trying to do. So the way Microsoft, this is at a high level, the way we think about inclusion and equity, first off, how do we enable students to gain independence and grow their potential? How can we enable every educator to reach every student? That's what they want to do. Sometimes they'll need some assistance with technology. And that at a school system level, I mean, luckily, the Skank School is fantastic here. But if you go out to a lot of public school systems in this country, as we're, we've heard a little bit of, uh, they're trying to, at scale, enable inclusion and equity. It's in part of every school system's mission that I talk to. It's just that they sometimes have struggled doing that because it's a hard problem. And so how can our platform help 
with that part of that vision that they're focusing on. From a pure accessibility standpoint, this is how Microsoft across the, the company, this is not an education thing, although it applies to education, we're really deeply focused on accessibility and inclusion. And there's many categories to accessibility. Historically, many people focus on vision, maybe deaf and hard of hearing. I mean, honestly, the, the learning side doesn't get as much focus. Dyslexia, dysgraphia, dyscalculia, uh, neurodiversity, autism, ADHD. So we have a set of technologies that we've built into our mainstream platforms. And this has been a really, really big push in the last few years. And the thing I, I, I hammer on these four things over and over again, and you're going to hear me say them again tonight, built in, mainstream, non-stigmatizing, free. And that's how we think about our platform. And we're a scale company, if you've heard the term, you know, we have large scale at Microsoft. And so we like to think we can help at scale, right? We're not just going to help in the United States. We're going to help in every country in the world is, is our goal. Now, from my education side, I talk a lot about the inclusive classroom. And so what does that mean? This is the way that I and, and, and my group just defines it. It's made up of four components, reading, writing, math, and communication. So I like to say, when you, when you talk to some school districts, as soon as you start to go deep in saying the words accessibility, they're like, oh, we've got some people that handle that over here. We're over here thinking about these other things. And so those topics up there, guess what? Every school cares about these things. And when you use inclusive design, that's what they're gonna care about. It's gonna help all students with reading or writing or whatever it is and it benefits all. So reading. So Beth mentioned, just as a backstory, you're probably thinking, why is this guy from Microsoft talking about dyslexia and they're talking about reading? Like, what's the backstory? I don't, you know, a lot of people ask us that. The backstory is we had a hackathon about three and a half years ago. And raise your hand if you know what the hackathon is. Ever heard that term? Some of you, genius hour for, in, for kids, where for one week out of the year, every Microsoft employee can work on whatever they want for a week, anything you're passionate about and with anyone else across the company, just form virtual teams and build stuff is the idea. So I actually, I've been working in education technology a while. Now, I actually don't have a background deeply in dyslexia historically, but I got together with a group of people who said, let's take the latest science and research around reading. There's a speech pathologist, there are reading PhDs, there's researchers, accessibility experts, and we said, let's build a little add-in. At the time, it was you know, a prototype, so it wasn't fully working. But we took a lot of these technologies around existing science and research around reading and we put them into these tools that initially, the, the set of tools we call learning tools, Microsoft learning tools. And particularly there's something called the immersive reader that was the key part of this project. And that's what I'm gonna show because what we've done is we've worked with a lot of teachers and students all around the world. Let me gather my, uh, my mouse here. I've got this podium that is a music stand so it's not the most natural of demo services but we're gonna adapt. So, uh, going to give a test for the audience. It's a hard test. Raise your hand if you've heard of Microsoft Word. Raise them high. All right. All right, good job. Now it's going to get harder. Raise your hand if you knew there's a free, fully free version of Word available in a browser, in the web, to every human on the planet. Free Word in the browser. Where'd all the hands go? I see like, and Beth doesn't count because she works at Microsoft. <laughs> there's like five people. See, so parents, students, every person has available, this thing I'm showing is not razzle dazzle, charge a lot of money. I have to always say free, because Microsoft has this legacy of people think Office is something I pay a lot of money for. This is free web Office. I'm just saying it again. I'm gonna go to the View tab and hit this button called the Immersive Reader. And I'm gonna walk through what you're gonna see. This is the thing that initially was born in the Hackathon project. So first off, we abstract a lot of the user interface. We call this focus mode. At the bottom, there's this nice play button, and if I hit play, the study of Earth's landforms It has built-in text-to-speech and word and line highlighting, which is not revolutionary, but guess what? Built-in, mainstream, non-stigmatizing, free. I can change the voice speed, make it slower, make it faster. I can choose a male voice or female voice, pretty standard stuff. can also change the way the page looks. So we know from research there's something known as visual crowding. Raise the, who's the visual crowding? People know about that in the audience. There's got to be a subset of people. For some folks, when you reduce visual crowding, it can help with focus and reading speeds. And so if I click increase spacing here, the line, letter, and words space out a little bit, let the text breathe. I can choose different background colors. Some people prefer different background colors when they read. 
And these are tuned for accessibility. There's many choices, so I can go to town and, and find the color that I might like best. I can also make the text much bigger. So some people, some dyslexics, prefer short line mode. Some early readers prefer short line mode. Some non-native speakers or people with vision impairments. Doesn't matter. I can choose whatever works for me. But now we're going to get into some of the fun stuff. So on the grammar options, uh, people here are familiar with breaking words into syllables. And so using our cloud technologies, if I click on the word syllables, it'll break those words into syllables when I click. Or highlighting parts of speech, like the nouns and verbs and adjectives, I can click on verbs, adjectives. You know, the adverb doesn't get enough respect, so you know, we even give <laughs> adverbs in there. I can show labels. So you can see I've got the nouns labeled, the verbs, and adjectives. And guess what? I get to personalize. So as a student, I'm independent. This is non-stigmatizing. You know, this person might use some of the things, and this person might use others. Guess what? We're all just using Word. So it's pretty non-stigmatizing. If I want to change the colors, great. I can make the nouns purple. It's very easy to, to personalize. Now the other thing we've got, who here knows? Raise your hand if you know what the reading ruler is. It's where I might cut out a little rectangle and slap the paper. So ADHD and dyslexia, pretty common together. Uh, it might be just to really focus on that line. So inspired by the real life reading ruler, if I go to line focus, I can get a reading ruler. And I can hit play. Geography. And Landforms can be it automatically and scrolls valid. so my eye doesn't have to sort of track all over the page. Glaciers or I can scroll it manually so I can move my reading ruler with the arrows over on the right. I can choose three lines or five lines. So here's what's interesting. Uh, we have students with cerebral palsy who use the reading ruler. It helps with eye focus. We didn't design it for that necessarily. We have a student that recently had a middle schooler. She had a concussion. I got a mail from this educator saying she uses line focus because she can't read during her recovery period unless she's got this, this focus on. So ways that we didn't initially plan for that, that are working. We also have the ability to get a picture dictionary. So clicking on rivers, different words. Rivers. Rivers. And now I can hear the word. I can see the word. I Valley. can look at the syllables broke. Again, it's, I can do this myself independently. And most recently, we also added translation. So uh, you know, I'm speaking to an audience who's familiar with dyslexia. I like to joke, uh, just because you speak Spanish natively and English is your second language doesn't mean you're also not dyslexic. <laughs> right? So that's like double the fun at that point. And I can turn on by word, for example. And I, we've got 60 languages. I know Robin would probably ask me as international, hey, is this just English? Well, of course not, Robin. 60 languages. We, we have, all we have is Afrikaans right now. We're working on other languages. We don't have Zulu. Um, but we have many languages. And so if I turn on by word, now maybe I'm going to go click on Earth, and I'll get Earth. Earth. Tierra. And I can have her Spanish. Earth. Tierra. And now maybe I'm going to go and translate the entire document into Spanish. And so I translate into Spanish, and everything changes. Syllables, parts of speech. Nouns, text to speech. El estudio de las formas terrestres de la tierra se llama geografía. And at the top, I can click on original. If I want to hear English again, and I can go flip back to Spanish. So now I can compare and contrast. And again, that can give me independence. So that's just plain Jane free word that most people didn't know about. And it's, it's there today. And it's not just in Word. It's built into OneNote, which is our digital binder, which is also free. It's built into Microsoft Teams, which is our classroom solution, which is also free. It's built into Outlook. It's built into the Edge browser. So here I am in our browser, which is free with Windows 10, Wikipedia. I can right click on anything in the web and just hit read aloud. Coliseum could hold. And I get the it word and line highlighting. Between 50, so no add ins, no doodads, no special teacher training. It's just the browser on a web page. Same thing with PDF files. So PDFs, pretty common. Edge browser, I can right click on any PDF and just hit read loud. Leveling the playing field with Microsoft learning tools. So building this into mainstream office, into mainstream windows, and design inclusively. So whoever wants to use it can. If you don't want to, then don't use it. And the other thing, since I have the browser up, I'll just show briefly. Um, so this is the actual course, the Dyslexia Awareness and Partnership with Made by Dyslexia. This is what 75,000 educators in the last few months have gone through. 
And, you know, there's a badge you get. There's the videos. There's the intro video from Richard Branson. There's different modules. What is dyslexia? I can't remember your name in the front, but I remember you from the video. Uh, <laughs> Orlando Bloom uh, highlights dyslexic strengths, dyslexic challenges. And so there's a whole module. There's reflections. There's some questions. And I've talked to many educators who have done this. And I'm in rooms presenting to people quite a bit, and I'll, I'll ask in a room full of this educators, who here learned all about dyslexia in teacher college? And guess how many hands go up? Like zero to one, maybe. And so many educators will see this and say, oh my gosh, I feel like, not that they're an expert, but they went from nothing to now I, I kind of get the basics and understand and have more empathy and awareness, and maybe I'm curious to learn more. And so these are great courses that we've planned out, and with Kate and Made by Dyslexia, we plan on doing more of them. And what's great is all it takes is a couple teachers in a school to plant a seed, and all of a sudden, oh, the other teachers start doing it, and all of a sudden it can spread over time. And so this is something that the largest education technology conference in the nation, ISTE, for those of you who have heard of that, it's in Philadelphia this year, Made by Dyslexia is going to go in the booth, and we're going to be evangelizing to a whole lot of teachers is, is the goal. Um, one more thing I'll show in the immersive reader as a demo here. Uh, this is called Microsoft OneNote. You know, we talk about executive functioning, we talk about ADHD, we talk about dyslexia. OneNote is a digital binder, like a trapper keeper. It's designed to be a binder. It's very popular in education. It's free. And for those of you who think Microsoft people only talk about Windows, 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 this is on Mac, it's on iPad, it's in the browser, it's on Android, it's, it's on my iPhone. So these products are available everywhere, not just Windows. Uh, if you have Chromebooks, great, works in a browser. But this is OneNote, digital binder. Very popular with dyslexic students, too, because they don't lose stuff. Everything's in one place. It's right there. I can search for it. But the power of this also is teachers and students, any picture you take or any screenshot you take and put into OneNote, this is a, from Harry Potter book. So we run optical character recognition. So if I hit that immersive reader button, that book is now converted into the immersive reader. And all those things we talked about, uh, nouns, verbs, text spacing, Let's just go crazy, and let's just convert Harry Potter page into Spanish, and then just read it out loud. Su progreso, su cabeza girando sobre su cuello largo. So what this means is universal access of content, right? We have students who, with an iPad, will take a picture, put it right in, and, and in real time be able to access this text and content that maybe before they couldn't. And so, again, built-in, mainstream, non-stigmatizing, and free. So I've demoed some stuff here, but I like to always show, I'm going to show now a video. And it turns out this video, very timely, was made in Georgia a few years ago. Uh, Holly Springs, I don't know if people are familiar with Holly Springs, fairly local. But these were some of the very first students who early on after that hackathon uh, started using Microsoft Learning Tools in the classroom. And I think it's a great uh, story to hear directly from the kids. The true purpose of education is to create possibility. It was a little hard for me. People laugh whenever I read sometimes. Well, they knew how to read, and I didn't. I will never be good at reading. I will probably be held back again. It highlights the words to know where I am. When it's reading, I see spaces between the words and it's easy to focus on. The first time I actually could read that book, I was proud of myself. I was very proud of myself. Good job, Joey. When technology and education come together, possibility becomes reality. I want to read every book in here. So those were some of the very first students that used this product. The other thing, though, that I'm actually going to tell this story because uh, I thought, you know, I'm actually in a, in a group that'll appreciate it more than most, talking about dyslexic strengths. So that, that ad actually, that ran on television uh, two years ago. And it ran on the Today Show and The View and a few other places. And when Microsoft makes something that's going to run on TV, they bring in something, it's called inside of Microsoft, the Black Ops team. Like, they're the best advertising team. They make the Super Bowl commercials. Like, they're the best of the best of creative people we can find. So when we were sitting in the room, that initial room, like brainstorming ideas, I met this whole the Black Ops crew. They brought in like, like 10 people. Um, and I was showing the immersive reader, talking about what it was designed for it, et cetera. 
And a bunch of the people in that room started getting somewhat emotional when I was talking about it. And basically, they started talking. It turns out, I, I believe it was eight out of 10 in that room were dyslexic. <laughs> eight of 10 of the most best black op creative, you know, commercial makers. Uh, and they're like, we're going to make the best commercial. <laughs> we're going all out on this. <laughs> and so no, it was amazing. It was, it was great. And, and so uh, I, I mean, that, that speaks to everything we're talking to here tonight. And this is the, the educator from Holly Springs, Lauren Pittman. She's talking about, she taught a lot of students dyslexia, dysgraphia, ADHD, third and fourth grade combined. She started seeing reading speeds in her classroom go up dramatically. She had IEP for many of the students, and they were measuring reading speeds. And what we often see is it's the confidence plus the independence plus the technology, the positive feedback loop. I don't think we're claiming it's like magic technology and there's nothing else involved. It's more about the positive feedback loop and we see this over and over again. We hear kids that have been frustrated for years, and now they're using just like all their friends. They're not using specialized software. It's not the thing that the teacher can't quite figure out. Uh, it's, it's like the main, I'm using Word. I'm using the browser. And we did a study with the British Dyslexia Association and the Knoll Hill School in UK. It's kind of like the Skank School, similar, but it's in the UK. And we saw that reading comprehension scores improved uh, with many of the students. We have eighth grade students using this. We have first graders, kindergartners. We also have CIOs. I've gotten mails from CIOs and major corporations who are telling us how the tools that are now built into Word have made life a lot easier for them. And so it's something that we like to say it's going to grow up with you. Because when you graduate school or you leave school or you go to college or the workforce, we find many students don't take the tools maybe with them that help because they're either stigmatized or oh, I can't remember what that thing was, or it's too expensive, or, or for whatever reason, they don't bring it. Well, with things like Office, a lot of people use Office in the world. And so if I go to work and I can continue to use these products, it grows up with me through life, and I can just keep using it all the way. I don't have to worry about, you know, I leave school and it's all gone. It's global, so it's used in all sorts of languages, all sorts of countries. We actually had, we have a teacher from Senegal I just met in a very poor village in Senegal who is using these tools uh, and they were helping learn English. They were French-speaking, learning English. And this is a large-scale study we did, uh, which is real t uh, RTI International, third-party study, in the general education population, uh, with fourth graders, sixth graders, 10th through 12th. And we saw that reading comprehension scores improved, writing improved, non-cognitive processes improved, and this is in the general education population. On average, 10% improvement with comprehension scores with fourth graders who've been using learning tools over a three-month period. And this is, everything's in this deck. This is a public deck, and so uh, I'll have a link up if you want to take a picture later. Uh, everything is available. Some great quotes, though. Uh, learning tools and the immersive reader are empowering, allows them to feel more independent, not depending on the teacher, not depending on peers. And we hear that all the time. But for me, the best part of this study is this, back to universal design and inclusive design. Nearly all the study teachers mentioned how the immersive reader enabled their readers, regardless of skill level, to access content aimed at a higher reading level. So guess what? It's helping all students across the board. Yes, it's going to help dyslexic students, and yes, it'll help emerging readers, and yes, it'll help all sorts of people, including the general education population, which is the whole purpose of inclusive design. This chart here, is, there's no test on this chart. I put this chart in on purpose. It is an eye chart on purpose. This chart communicates Microsoft is building this across everything we do. This is called a tidal wave. If you're a poker player, this is called all in on inclusive technologies, reading, literacy, dyslexia. And I always like to say very explicitly, we're not stopping. So it's not like we're done. We're going, we're working with the top researchers. We're working with top dyslexia experts in the field. And we're going to keep building this into our mainstream products. And we're going to keep at it. So I just want to make sure that folks in this room got that message. The other thing we have is writing. So I'm not going to go too deep into writing, but I want to make sure on the writing side, because no one knows these things have been coming into our products. Word, PowerPoint, Outlook, OneNote, all have speech-to-text dictation built in. Raise your hand if you knew that speech-to-text is built in across Office. Let me seven, eight. Totally there today. So dictation in multiple languages. Dictate your emails, dictate in Word, dictate anywhere. Word prediction. Word prediction is built into Windows 10. You can turn on word prediction, like on your phone, where it predicts the words. Great with dysgraphia. I mean, dyslexics will prefer that. We also have next generation spell checking. So if I go here, 
You probably didn't think spell checkers changed much in the last 20 years. Uh, you'd reference spell checking earlier. Well, in Word now, the spell checker has this brand new thing called editor, which is next generation spell checker, and it is great for dyslexia, dysgraphia, and all human beings. It groups the spelling errors into a bunch of categories. So now if I click spelling, it highlights the word. If I hit the little arrow on the upper right, it jumps me through the document. So I can actually, instead of seeing 300 squiggly lines, it focuses and jumps. I've got read aloud for my spell errors, talking spell check. I got suggestions that I can read aloud and get context on every word. So simple things that most people might ignore, but dyslexia, dysgraphia, that's a big deal. Grammar error is the same thing. I can jump through the document, I can read them out loud, I can get suggestions that have read aloud built in. And then we have new things like clarity and conciseness. We have natural language processing to give new types of feedback on your document. Clarity and conciseness, gender neutral language, maybe you're saying policeman and fireman all the time and then it'll say, oh, you should say firefighter or police officer. So there's a bunch of new categories that are rolling out into editor that are just built in and help everyone with inclusive design, but they'll really help someone with dyslexia or dysgraphia, ADHD. The last thing I'm gonna demo, and I'll wrap it up in a moment, but math gets talked about a little bit, but back to OneNote. So here I am in OneNote, OneNote supports digital inking, digital writing. And I'll just say it again, because people don't believe half time, all this is free. So this is a free version of OneNote we're talking about here. I go to math, and first off, it converts the ink into an equation. That's nice. Now I select an action. So think about independence in helping me with math. I could say solve for R, that solves the equation. But I actually want to see the steps and understand what's happening. So I can say show steps using the quadratic formula. It'll actually work out all the steps here and I can go through and look at that and practice and understand. And now you're saying, well, Mike, that looks super dense. If I have visual crowding and I'm trying to read words and numbers, that, that's gonna be a pain. And you're right, so there's a little immersive reader button there. So if I click immersive reader, Everything goes right in the immersive reader, including equations. And if, I've, you know, if I want to focus on one line at a time, and this will read my equations out loud, you know, now I can do everything I need to do. And this reads all sorts of complex equations, depending on what you're doing. And if I want to get a picture dictionary on subtract, great, I can do that too. Subtract. So we talk about inclusive math, right? It could be dyslexia, dyscalculia, could be focusing, could be whatever. You could translate this stuff into other languages too. But the idea is, again, it's reading, writing, math. I'm not talking about communication today, but we have a lot of tools to help with English language learners. But the idea is we're building this into our mainstream products and making it available at scale. So I'll just close uh, wrapping up here. This is uh, Marley Matlin. She's actually a deaf Academy Award winning actress, but she came to Microsoft to talk about inclusion. I think it applies to every, everything we're talking about here. No one should have to ask for access. It should just be there. That means, hey, I need the expensive software. Hey, my teacher can't figure it out. Or hey, I'm super stigmatized. I don't want to do this because I'm embarrassed. Just be built in. Just should be part of the oxygen that you're breathing. And it's going to benefit everyone at that point. And so to close, just to recap, Microsoft, we're trying to enable students to grow their independence and their potential. We want to enable teachers to reach every learner, and then how can we help school systems and districts meet their inclusion and equity goals? And so with that, I will just leave this up here. Uh, that is the deck. Any teacher, any you know, parent, any school leader, that's a public deck that's available that has everything I talked about and more and details and reports. Um, reach out to me directly on email if you'd like, or if you use a Twitter, tweet right at me. I'm happy to tweet back but happy to learn more and, and gather feedback in any way that we can help. I appreciate it. Thank you. That was fantastic. Thank you so much. And, and one thing I want to emphasize about that uh, uh, that I don't think we can say enough is, is the word free, right? All that is free. Uh, and the next time you uh, are in the classroom, because I, I forgive me, it's my pet peeve, I have to say it, and the teacher tells you that using those tools are cheating, you look at her and say, you are cheating my child of their ability to show their potential, you stupid, stupid <laughs> person. Because uh, that's one of my, my, my pet peeves, and we have these amazing things. 
and then we deny our, our kids it. But I guarantee you, all the folks that we had up on this stage tonight, especially those folks who are highly su successful and are dyslexic, they continue to use this stuff, right? Uh, so often we forget that our classrooms aren't reflections of the real world. So um, as, as we wrap up tonight, as I was sitting here, uh, first I want to thank Robin again so much. For, unbelievable, unbelievable. <laughs> Truly. And it occurred to me, we're, we're sitting here tonight, we have CNN, we have Richard Branson, we have Microsoft, all talking about dyslexia. But what's really going to make the difference is when you leave here tonight, if you will commit, if you will promise, continue to have this conversation, right? Facebook, have this conversation. Mom, I know you're watching. Tell everybody one more time. Uh, go back to your schools. 75,000 teachers have gone through this training. Have the teachers in your child's schools done it? The school down the street, the school you graduated from? That's how we're going to make the change. I, I, or if, go back to James's comments that while we all know what, how powerful and how amazing it is, right? Unless we talk about it, unless we do something about it, it's not going to change. And, and I want to say very quickly, uh, 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 bef before we do end, on, on Made by Dyslexia's website, they have a dyslexia pledge where schools, where businesses can go and they can pledge that they are going to do everything they can to recognize and support dyslexic learners. Microsoft was the first company in the world to sign that. Tonight, as we sit here in this room, we have folks like the Swift School, like Walker School, local schools that have all made that pledge. And I would encourage you all to do that as well, to look at that and to have these conversations. Next time you're at the grocery store, you're looking at the bologna. You know what makes me think about bologna? Dyslexia. Start talking to them, right? <laughs> it's the only way we're going to make this happen. So, um, again, thank you so much to Made by Dyslexia. Thank you to Microsoft. Thank you to all of you. A couple quick logistical things on our way out. We do have some refreshments set up, so if you would like to, to stay and have some conversations and network, we'd love you to. We have a, a bar set up right here. We also have one right outside these doors. For those of you that uh, uh, drove on the shuttle, you could pick those up uh, right. I'm, I'm, I'm saying this right, I believe. No one's telling me no. So right outside uh, the, the doors where you came in, up those stairs, we'll have the shuttles running to the uh, off-site parking. Um, and again, thank you so much for taking the time to be here tonight. And thank you for spreading the word.